Yes. All right. And I don't think that. Hi, Amy. Hi, Vivi. Hi, Hermes. Wipe your feet off, please. And don't rip the sheet. <laughs> Amy, I'm going to mute you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I totally get it. Um, awesome. Well, welcome, everyone. We are recording and uh, super excited to be here. We're going to just jump in, too. So uh, I'm going to try to do a good job of keeping keep um, people, you know, coming into the waiting room as well while I'm doing this. But I'm super excited to have Joseph here. He's kind of like our, our um, I don't know, resident expert on filtration. Um, he's kind of where we all go to ask questions <laughs> about filtration and specific situations and, um, and what is the best thing to do, whether it's like, you know, a uh, regular city water someplace or it's you know in the backwoods of Nicaragua or, or Mexico or wherever so I know that this is where we go so hi Vivi <laughs> um awesome so just a little bit about Joseph he's actually worked in water filtration for over 15 years so he has some really really good knowledge he has been the vice president of sales for a company called Natural Action Technologies, which focuses more on structured water. Um, so he also knows a lot about structured water as well. And he just has, he has helped thousands of people, thousands of people improve their water in, in their areas and with both filtration and structuring their water. So today he does, he helps multi-pure builders provide some, multi-pure is an affiliate, they have an affiliate program. And he helps people provide the best possible filtration for drinking water while still retaining the water's critical minerals. So this is really important and he'll be talking about this too. So filtering the waters so that it can keep the minerals that are so important to our bodies um, and for a variety of applications, including structuring and ionization. So the water has to be... Um, a... Mesa. Mesa. Okay, thank you. Okay, when I'm done. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, so your your water has to be in the right um, I'm not sure what the right word is here, but uh, the right way in order for it to be ionized. So it has to have minerals in it, for example. And Joseph will talk about that as well. So um. I am just happy you're here, and this is something you're going to be able to share with other uh, other people as well, and um, you know other people who are interested in what we have to offer, and uh, because there's a lot here, and you, we do need to look at filtration, and I'm still admitting people, so we do need to think about filtration because, um, and some leaders talk about this, and some don't, but a Kangen water system, a magic water system has a filter in it, but it basically only filters out chlorine at this point in time. So we do need to think about uh, pre-filtration. Chlorine, filtering out chlorine is great, but it's not enough, right? If we're, if we are truly care about our water and anyone who has a Kangen water system cares about our water, <laughs> we do need to, to pre-filter it. So I just want to thank Joseph for being here, taking your precious time to support our community and um, share your wisdom uh, and I'm just going to ask some questions and Jess, if I can um, actually let you co-host so you can let people in, that would be amazing too, if you don't mind. And you and I could both, mo both monitor questions. You guys could put questions into the comment section as well. We are going to talk about, I kind of wrote a list of topics, but we will be talking about like different types of filtration kind of categories um, NSF certifications, fluoride, hard water, water softeners, and some specific um, types of filtration systems that some of us know a little bit about maybe, like ion faucet, the Enagic filter, Berkey, and, and then and multi-pure as well. So just to let you know what we will be covering, if there's something else that you're interested in, in you can certainly put it in the, in the comments and we'll be monitoring that. Jess and I will monitor that. Um, and, and, uh, Jess, is there anything else you wanted to share here at the beginning? Hi, no, I was actually getting a massage that went until just now, even though I told her I had to be done. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> but no, I, I think the, the importance of, you know, the NSF and what that actually means. And I know there's a lot of 
misinformation out there and just people are the, a lot of confusion. So I think like just clearing that up for people would be really incredible. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So, um, okay. So Joseph, I'm just going to ask like the first question, I would just love the bigger picture, right? Like what are the different filtration categories, like technologies that are out there so that we can understand when we're looking at different companies? Cause I know there's thousands and thousands of different filtration companies. There's a lot of local ones and, um, that, that just start, start up a company and it would be helpful for us to get that bigger picture to start off with. Sure. Yeah. If it's okay, I'll start kind of how I got into this and yeah. what this whole space was like back then and then yeah. kind of how it's evolved now. I got into this. I read the book, Natural Cures. They don't want you to know about by Kevin Trudeau. I was like 18 at the time. That book sold like 10 million copies. And um, it basically, I, I was a normal person as far as, you know, my mom was a nurse. I got fed all the drugs and all the vaccines growing up. You know what I mean? We ate McDonald's. Uh, anytime I was sick, I was getting penicillin, all the normal stuff. Right. And, uh, you know, I had ADD and I had other health issues I, and I, they were just normal stuff. I thought I read that book and it basically talked about eating organic, um, cleansing, natural lifestyle. And it had just a whole chapter in it. That was basically like lists of stuff to do. And one of them was drinking and showering in filtered water. And besides the only thing I'd ever even seen or conceived of back then along those lines was like the Brita filters at the store. That's the only thing I ever knew of. And the only reason you would do it is because it would make it taste a little better. There was no consciousness of like, there might be something unhealthy in the water. There just, there was nothing in my, me or anyone I knew had ever had a thought like that in our whole lives, you know? So when I read that book, I, for whatever reason of all the stuff in there, and I did a lot of the stuff in there, uh, the water thing just struck a natural chord with me. And, you know, I kind of had an obsessive mind, uh, you know, at that age, I, I still do to an extent today. So when I got interested in it, this is in the earlier days of the internet, you know, this is think 2006, 2007. Uh, I just researched everything I could and I, any filter I could find, I would buy it and I would test it, you know, shower filters and drinking water filters. And wow. I seen better than others and they all worked a little differently. So I'll go over the different types. But what came out of that was I just had a really natural interest. It wasn't something I had to like uh, try to like, it just, I had a natural enthusiasm about learning about that stuff. And that fed into me becoming a dealer for a lot of these companies back then. I used to be a dealer for a lot of companies. So that's how I started. I got into that, this whole space. Now, the different types of filters, back then I had no discernment of what was what. And it was just whatever I could kind of find. And the majority of filters you see on the market, Brita's, um, any kind of like carbon filter for the most part, including the one inside the Enagic that's WQA certified, they would be, the category of that would be loose media filters, which means basically it's a cartridge and there's loose material inside, primarily carbon. The Brita filters are, I think, entirely carbon. And the Enagic one is carbon with a little bit of calcium sulfide in it. So uh, that's, a huge segment of the water filter world is loose media filters. And they go all the way from like the pitcher size Brita's all the way to whole house ones that are, you know, six feet tall and a foot and a half wide. And they're similar in the sense that they're just different size containers with media inside them. So that's one category, loose media filters. Uh, then another category is um, solid carbon blocks. That's a more recent innovation in water technology. Now, I think it started in the 70s or 80s. The first solid carbon blocks came out. And what that is, is basically you can take carbon. And these days with like Multipure, for example, you can take carbon and other medias and blend them. And you can form them into a solid block that looks something like a paper towel roll or a toilet paper roll. So a hollow center and walls and an outside diameter. And what that does is force the water through the walls under pressure so that you can fix the path the water has to travel through. Significant because when you have any loose media filter, what happens is water will always follow the path of least resistance. So when there's grains in the filter of carbon that they're size like a, a piece of rice, what happens is initially it'll work fantastic. But over time, and it doesn't take very long in most cases, the water, just because yes. by nature, 
going to follow the path of least resistance, it will basically push those grains aside and form like a little river through it. So those rivers are called channels. So over time, these channels will form through lo loose media filters and the water will basically, it will always follow the path of least resistance. So whenever it can, it'll flow through these channels where it has no interference from any media. And over time, a higher percentage of the water passing through the filter will go through the channels rather than actually contacting the media itself. And you'll have water going through the whole thing without actually ever touching any carbon. So in the beginning, this is what you see. And this is what you see a lot when people get whole house filters is they feel amazing on day one. And then two to three, four months later, they still feel good, but it's like the, there was like a drop off. It's like my showers were like dream level initially, but now they're still better than they were before I got it, but they're not like blowing my mind anymore. Pretty common reaction from loose media filters. Um, so solid carbon blocks eliminate that need by basically having the, the carbon under pressure and heat fused with binding ingredients and fixing the pore sizes so that the water has no choice but to go through the media. So that's the beginning of solid carbon block technology. Within that, there's different categories. We can dive a little deep into that later. Um, then other categories of filtration these days, distillation is one and reverse osmosis is another. It's kind of in its own category. And deionization, you really don't deal with that that much at the whole at the uh, consumer level. That's more like a lab grade thing. You know, when they're making pharmaceuticals and they need lab grade water, they're reverse osmosising it, or some cases they're double reverse osmosising it, and then they're putting it through these deionization beds, which will literally take every solid thing out of it. Uh, the challenge, it's just really not practical on a user level. One example of deionization uh, is the zero water filter. Have you ever seen those? Uh, in the store they're like pitchers uh and they'll produce zero tds water for like 15 gallons or something because the deionization media if you're using regular tap water burns through really quick so um really not practical and i'm not the whole thing is kind of like a gimmick in my opinion with the zero water because if you saw what you were paying per gallon <laughs> to actually like what you were changing those cartridges all the time it's just not cost effective at all and it's mineral deficient anyway, you know, so it's, it's in most cases acidic. So kind of a gimmick, in my opinion, that um, that technology. So those are the kind of categories, loose media, solid carbon block, reverse osmosis, uh, distillation and deionization. And in my mind, you can I, I kind of put RO distillation and deionization kind of in their own sphere because they're not um, it's almost not even filtration at that point anymore. You're um you're really uh, kind of separating out solids from the water and they're just doing it different ways. The solid carbon block and loose media uh, are both filtering the water while leaving the minerals in. So they're kind of off over here. The other ones are kind of off over here and they all have their applications in different uh, areas of life. Um, not everybody likes reverse osmosis. I, I don't particularly like it unless it's... Um, but there are scenarios, and I, and I get, I probably get two to three uh, texts or calls a day from um, Anagic people, or my group and my uh, multi peer. Most of them are Anagic, not all of them. Um, and there are cases where I recommend reverse osmosis because it's really the only option. Can but, you expand on that a little bit? Because reverse yeah. osmosis is something that you know is taken like a lot of people are, are using it because they're more. I, I believe more people are becoming water aware. Yeah. And they're um and then they're like, oh, let's do reverse osmosis, get rid of get rid of everything. But yeah, they're paper, so yeah. On paper, it looks great, you know, because it it does take out the most stuff at the highest level by far. It also takes out all the good stuff. It also takes out um like it takes wastewater to produce good water. So you're wasting water just to produce a gallon of good water. And it's gotten better in that respect. It used to be that to produce one gallon of reverse osmosis water you will be burning, depending on your water quality, two, three, four, five gallons of wastewater. These days, the membranes are getting more efficient. Uh, so sometimes now you can get one gallon of good water and like sometimes less than a gallon of wastewater, but you are wasting water. And you're also just making water into a form that's really not natural. The, the closest thing to any kind of mineral deficient water, well, the only mineral deficient water on earth is um, rainwater. You know, and it's not, it's not the best for, you know, in a survival situation, it'll get you through, but it's not the ideal for drinking routinely, you know? 
Uh, it's got no minerals in it. It's naturally acidic. So reverse osmosis and distilled water are closer to that. As far as, you know, there's just not, um, there's just not water. There's in nature besides rainwater that's mineral deficient. It just doesn't happen. You know, any spring, any river stream, they're all picking up trace mineral amounts. And that's part of kind of the equation of that, of a natural or kind of living water. So uh, the closer in, in my mind, this, this gets a little philosophical to the further down you go in this, but you could go the scientific route and just be looking at contaminants, eliminating everything. And that's, that's important. Then there's like, what's like the natural real thing. You know what I mean? Just like you could have, <laughs> you could have like um, soap or uh, any shampoo products that will clean all the stuff off of you no matter what, or you can have something more natural. That's maybe not as, um, absolutely pure as far as what the, the stuff it's removing leaves more oils in your hair but it's closer to nature you know what i mean so these yeah. are the the end result you're going for can be subjective that way depending on what you're going for sure yeah so reverse osmosis so when, oh. would you like me to explain how that works um yeah maybe in a simple terms yeah, just yeah. because it is so popular but yeah yeah here's what it does i mean they're going to filter it with some loose media usually first so it's going to go through like a loose media carbon filter and then basically what it is it's a, it's a membrane it's like a piece of plastic and the water is under pressure um and it's basically forced against that plastic and some of the water will pass through to some degree and the solids won't and they go out of waste too it's that simple and when you say solids are you talking about minerals minerals contaminants okay everything. yeah everything okay and so i think the key question is is why are minerals in the water important? Like, yeah. Well, depends on what your use is. Um, first of all, like, you know, like any, any spring water has minerals. I think the mm -hmm. most natural waters uh, that occur anywhere in nature, they all have minerals in it. Um, so mm -hmm. I think it's just a healthier, um, a healthier place to be, to be drinking water that has minerals, in my opinion. Yeah. There's exceptions. Some, some people, I've seen people do fasts. And for fast, sometimes we'll do distilled water because they just want what, what will happen is water that doesn't have minerals like rainwater, distilled water, reverse osmosis will tend to pull minerals out of your body to kind of balance itself. Water in its natural state like has stuff in it. You know what I mean? It's not just pure water. So when it's not in that state, it wants to like grab. That's why when it rains, the rainwater will grab like from the soil and stuff minerals. So by the time the, the plant's uptaking it, it's got minerals in it. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, oh, sorry. Well, I was going to ask too with the Enagic system, yeah. if somebody has reverse osmosis, what do you typically recommend? Do you typically recommend remineralizing or getting a different filter? I'll, you know, yeah, completely. Yeah, it depends what their goal is. Um, at, at minimum, they need to remineralize at bare minimum if they're going to keep the reverse osmosis. If they are, let me tell you the reasons I get calls why people want to switch out of reverse osmosis. Uh, you no, normally they have a tank based RO system. That means there's a tank with a bladder inside that fills up from the membrane under pressure. And then once you use that water in the tank, you got to wait for it to refill for regular people that, you know, aren't using an ionizer or anything and don't really know what they're doing with their filtration to have a couple gallons of water on demand. And then that runs out, they have to re wait for it. That's not that big of a deal. But Enagic users like to use a lot of water. So that usually doesn't fly for very long when they're getting a gallon. You know, and remember, if, they, if there's a, if that bladder holds two gallons and you use it all, that means you're getting like, like a gallon and a third of Congan water because the rest is going to be wastewater, right? So, yeah. um, and that just isn't enough to satiate most people when they're, you know, spending so much on an Enagic. So away from RO. The other reason is hard, hard to adequately remineralize RO for, you can get it to where it works for the Enagic, but um, it's still, in my experience, the, the parts per million of mineral content stays pretty low. With most of the remineralizations, part of the challenge is there's just not a, there's not a remineralizing cartridge that I'm like in love with at, at this point um, that really does a great job. And then the ones that do bring a higher TDS count that I found, they're also what's, throwing, sorry. What's TDS? Total dissolved solids. Okay. Yeah. Which means That's, what? Well, it could be anything, but you know, when the water is already reverse osmosis, we're really talking about minerals. 
Okay. Yeah. And for TDS, the way it works is if you're under 80 TDS, your water at, out of your house, that would be considered soft water. Over 80 is kind of when you're getting into hard. And then there's degrees of hardness. I mean, um, you could have 150 and that would be considered hard water, but that's still pretty, um, like when I've been in homes that have that level of water, it's really not that bad. Then you have hard water that's like 500 parts per million TDS. So 500 is when you, you're taking a shower and like you can't rinse the soap off your arm, no matter how much water you're putting on it, it seems like. But that's that's real hard water. So there's a spectrum here. Um, the Enagic, in my experience, runs best when it's um, water's slightly hard, but not really hard. So 80, 100, 150 in that range. It's, it's tough to get reverse osmosis water up to that level. Now you can get it to where it works. It'll produce, you know, the 9.5 water. Um, the, um, and I just had a talk today, but the, um, the emulsification with the 11.5 water can be challenging when the TDS is low. It doesn't always work, even with the, um, the enhancer solution. So, uh, but you're, and you're not going to get probably as high of an uh, H2 level as you're going to get if you had a little bit harder water. So the sweet spot for an ionizer, um, in my experience, 80 to 150 range, you know, and I've seen it could be harder than that too. When it gets harder than that, you know, the taste can be a little different just depending on what's in that water mineral wise. Um, but this one challenge with the RO is getting water that's got enough TDS, even after remineralization. And some of these remineralization cartridges, the other challenges, I've seen ones that um, do a little better on the TDS, but then they're actually in just what they have in them is raising the pH already. So you might have water coming out of the remineralizer already at like eight and a half, which mm -hmm. not ideal at that point, you know? So to keep water closer to seven, between seven and eight, going into your Nagic with a higher TDS out after RO, challenging. I don't really have, I don't have like a plug and play solution for that at this point. And can you uh, measure TDS easily? Like the average person can, how do it, you measure TDS? You can buy a little meter on Amazon and they're cheap. You know, they're okay. like a couple dollars. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. And you measure that at the faucet or where do you measure it? Like, well, I mean, when it, when it comes to your enagic, probably best to measure it after whatever pre-filtration you have, you know, cause that could okay. affect, but you could have a higher number going into your filter, your pre-filter. But if a, a part of that number is like lead that's being filtered out, you want to look at the number with what's actually going into your machine, you know? Yep. Yep. Amazing. This so, is like so helpful. Good, good. Yeah. So to really answer your question, some people want to switch out of reverse osmosis and there's good options for that. Some people um, don't, or they don't want to invest in something else or, um, here's here's the thing the good the good side of reverse osmosis it takes out everything pretty much not 100 percent of everything but most stuff most stuff you could think of and um one of them is fluoride and there's really just not another good solution to get if you want going into your machine to get like 90 uh plus percent of fluoride out it's really the only way i know there's a lot of stuff out there other products that will say they remove fluoride Bottom line is this, there's not a single filter in the NSF database that's ever passed or the WQA database that I found, and I've looked at both extensively, or the there's really three main databases, NSF, the WQA, which you guys know, and then the third one is called IAPMO, I-A-P-M-O, International Association of Plumbers, something, something. The IAPMO r &T database tests the same NSF standards as WQA and NSF does. I haven't, there's nothing that's ever passed any, um, any non-reverse osmosis product has, has never passed the fluoride protocol for any of those databases. So there just isn't one right now. Um, you see a lot of stuff marketed as fluoride solutions. Um, so I, I told you kind of how it was when I started uh, is, is it, it, the water filter space. I didn't know what was what. Here's kind of how it is today. There's, there's like the bulk of, companies selling water filters are mostly selling the same stuff. And that's just standard size housing. And this is ion faucet. This is um, most uh, kind of a magic um, builder tool stores I've seen. This is um, a lot of companies that have their own brand. If you go Googling and you try to find a, uh, and why do people do this? Mostly you try to find a non-reverse osmosis filter that's gonna filter fluoride. 
you're going to run into some little company that's got some cartridge saying it will, and it's probably going to be standard housings with standard size cartridges. And they're basically just buying a bunch of these housings and buying a bunch of different cartridges and kind of mixing and matching. That's what that is. Um, that's a huge- When you say standard cartridges, are you say that's like loose media cartridges? Could what does be, that mean? Could be, could be anything. Could be solid carbon block or loose media. Okay. Um, or other stuff we didn't really even get into that's really not that applicable. Like ceramic cartridges kind of look like a um, candlestick. That's yep. if you have bacteria, not very common um, for the type type of applications we're talking about. That's more like a if you if you live in a well and there's bacteria and that's it. Um, so it could be anything, but there's standard size cartridges. The standard size is two and a half inches diameter versus ten inches ten inches long, and um, there's a lot of there's an ocean of products you can swap into these housings, you know. So what most companies do is they they get you a standard housing and they do something like get get your zip code and they look at your e um ewg tap water report and they say well this is what you got in your water and here's the filters that filter those things out so let's match what what's what this thing's showing us to what oh. these cartridges say they're going to do and then that's your solution that's that right there it, it, the majority of the water filter market today is what just that challenges um number one ewg is not my favorite because the data is not always up to date or uh, yeah up to date is really the issue so it's not accurate anymore um the other thing is the bigger issue though is most of the cartridges that fit in the standard housings are really not tested for anything in a, in a way that's uh let's say objective and scientific and that's where a lot of false claims come from right there um if i have a little mom and pop water filter store online and i want to sell something and there's really no reason for people to buy it for me because everything i have is generic you know and i'm just mixing and matching generic stuff uh i could say something like this activated alumina cartridge filters out 99 percent of fluoride which you can if the water going into it is between five and six ph which you will never have coming out of the tap because that would erode the pipes right uh, if you read the wqa's report on media two media specifically activated alumina bone char carbon they only work when uh the water is acidic and under six specifically you put them in alkaline water what happens is the alkaline minerals compete with the media uh, they burn up effectively the media really fast so and in the beginning this is what they'll do is they'll say hey it takes out 99 percent of fluoride we'll take a brand new cartridge filter one gallon of, of tap water through it and test the before and after, and it takes out all the fluoride. Well, within 25 to 50 gallons, it's going to be taking out less than 20% of fluoride in the majority of cases. Where did I get that? That's from the executives at Multipeer because they have an in-house lab. They have a lab testing these things because the number one request they get is a non-reverse osmosis filter that can filter fluoride. So if they buy everything, they test it. The common outcome on real world water, uh, they usually fail in less than 100 gallons and sometimes less than 50, sometimes less than 25. Fail mean no statistically significant decrease in fluoride um, in the water. So this is what a lot of the world is today in water filtration. Just standard generic stuff with misleading claims. And that's how... Um, kind of a lot of that world goes so you, you people they sell people in the idea of what the water what the filter should do um and they're making the claims based off like what the filter could do under like the most idyllic circumstances and with no regard to how long it would do it for you know yeah, yeah. So that, that's wow. the state that's kind of the state of the we all in all unfortunately so what, how do you find filters that are objective and scientific then? Yeah, there's, there's really three three places and I named them already. The NSF database, the WQA database, and um, the IATMO R&T database. Um, the, the NSF and the WQA are must, much easier to search. And important that when you're looking at uh, water filters that are in these databases and they're certified per, for performance, it will list everything that they've passed the NSF test for. 
here's why the NSF protocol tests are important. This is why WQA is not NSF. It's its own organization. Why are they testing to the NSF protocols? Because they account for all the factors that you could use to manipulate the results. They account for the water chemistry, the pH, the total dissolved solids, mineral content. Uh, like for example, lead and mercury have to pass both that six and a half and eight and a half pH because of pH will affect the results. So if you can pass for both of those, that range encompasses like 95% of all tap waters just between those, you know. Um, they account for, um, importantly, the duration. So um, this is what you get a lot with these with, with these kind of mom and pops is like, hey, you have, uh, you have hexavalent chromium in your water. Well, this carbon filter filter is chromium. Well, number one, they don't even look at how much chromium concentration there. I mean, a lot of water has trace amounts of chromium in it. We're, it's not Aaron Brockovich levels of chromium most of the time. Mm -hmm. It's rare, you know. Um, but if it were, the filter they're giving you ain't ain't treating that level of of chromium in the water, you know. Sure. So this it's like it's it's solving the idea in your head of the issue, but it's really not treating the real issue. And most of the time, the stuff they list is, in my opinion, kind of uh, exaggerated or redundant. Like they might have a lot of stuff listed that looks real scary in EWG, but in fact, they kind of all fall, they're all one category of chemicals, you know? Um, so NSF protocols adjust for all the parameters that could pr produce a misleading result. And they test for the duration of the cartridge life. So like in the case of the, um, the filter inside the magic machines, they pass for chlorine taste and odor for 1500 gallons. To get that 1500 gallon certification, it had to pass that test for 3000 gallons. And then they cut that in half. So, and they're testing chlorine at a concentration. This is the other part I didn't mention. They're testing the contaminants at concentrations that are substantially higher than you will most likely ever see in a real world scenario. Mm -hmm. So they're testing the water, controlling all the variables, they're testing at a super high concentration, the contaminant, and then however many gallons it passes for, they're cutting num that number in half. So layers of redundancy here to like show this legitimate, the result. Okay. So that's why NSF certifications are important. They really show what's realistic and for performance wise from this filter. For example, when uh, the Flint, Michigan incident happened, Multipure sent a team there to the Boys and Girls Club. They sent a couple pallets of filter systems there. And what I was told is the level of lead they had in the water there in that crisis scenario was like right there with where the NSF testing was level wise. So even that scenario wasn't like egregiously beyond what the NSF yeah. testing level is. So that's how you know it's it's going to work. You know what I mean? Yeah. So can you speak a little bit to the NSF certifications around materials versus performance and yeah. how that's yeah people work, work around that? This is really important because if you call Ion Faucet or a lot of these companies and you say, are you NSF certified? They'll say, yeah. And what that means is there, there's two levels of certification. And this is, I don't know why NSF does it like this, but this, they kind of, um, I don't say they allow it, but they, they set it up so that's easy to see people this way. There's there's two things. Material safety is number one. So the media inside any cartridge sold in North America is supposed to be and usually is tested for material safety. And all that means is if you run your water through that media, it's not going to put anything in the water that's going to harm you. That's really all it means. doesn't mean it's effective at doing what it's supposed to do. It just means it's not uh, harmful or risky, um, not dangerous. So that's a really easy certification to get. Um, and what happens is companies will use the NSF emblem based off that their products are selling, which they don't even manufacture. And a lot of times they don't even know where they're manufactured because there's someone else's private label they're buying in wholesale. Uh, it'll come with that NSF material safety stamp and they'll put that on their website and say NSF certified. So that's material safety certification. The performance certification is what I just described, and that's a whole different level of certification. Extremely difficult to pass, um, especially for the tougher contaminants, volatile organic compounds, lead, mercury, arsenic, uh, MTBE, PCB, um, the forever chemicals, PFOS, PFOA, PFOS. 
they're really tough certifications to get because you have to, it, you're, the water's going to be spiked at a high level and there's the parameters are such that there's no getting around, uh, there's no tricks to play as far as producing a higher percentage or result. So you really have to have a product that delivers. And um, that certification is tough to get and it, it is expensive to get as well. So what a lot of companies will do is use the material certification badge to make you think it's performance certified when it's not. And that's why if you call Ion Faucet, are you guys NSF certified? Yeah, all of our stuff is, you know, it's not, it's not performance certified. Yeah, okay. Wow, yeah, that can be deceptive, I see. So can we go back to the fluoride question too? Like, is there a way to at least minimize if there's, I, I think what you said, if, if this is correct, is like reverse osmosis probably gets you the best result in terms of removing yeah. fluoride, but then it has this other side effect of removing the solids, the the minerals. Yeah, is yeah. there another way to at, at least remove some of the fluoride or the bulk of it? Yeah. The reality is carbon filters and more so carbon blocks than loose carbon filters will reduce some. Um, what is the percentage it's going to be? It will vary drastically because the fluoride they put in water, first of all, two sources of fluoride. There's naturally occurring fluoride. Some people think that's a hazard. I personally don't think a, a compound that occurs naturally in spring waters around the world in minute amounts is a hazard. Just me. Some people think any fluoride, including natural, uh, naturally um, occurring is a hazard. I don't. What, what does that account for? Most times that I've seen it differentiated between the naturally occurring fluoride and then the one, the fluoride that's added by the municipal pad. This is really what we're concerned about here, adding fluoride to water, right? Um, these days, most water supplies are, are a lot less fluoride than they used to be. They used to run with like one and a half parts per million. There was kind of a um, informal, um, like a Congress or a meeting, uh, and I forget what it was called, but it basically it was a council that on health guidelines that met that said, hey, maybe that's a little high. Maybe a healthier guideline is 0.7 parts per million. So basically they most most water supplies are like half of what they were 20 years ago. So that's already good. Of the 0.7, when I've seen it differentiated, um, and how how do you see this? I saw water supplies that were right, really close to each other, water uh, water quality reports of towns really close to each other, both coming from ground sources. One of them added fluoride, one didn't. The one that added fluoride was coming out at like 0.7 parts per million. The one that didn't and just had naturally occurring, the tests were between 0.2 and 0.3 parts per million. So roughly two thirds of it is what's being added in most cases. That'll vary obviously. Uh, depending on your particular water that your the, the municipal plant starting with, um, what's realistic to get without reverse osmosis? I've seen um, first of all, I've seen zero. I've seen it go down none. I've seen it go down ten percent. The highest I've ever seen sixty percent. I've seen a point seven go down to point three with just a multi pure filter. That's the highest I've ever seen, and I, you know, I haven't seen this tested all that frequently because. Um, you know, most people just don't have fluoride meters sitting around, you know, um, yeah. or they're not going to pay to send it off to a lab. So what's realistic? Realistic 10 to like 25, 30% is like realistic, to be honest. With and, a multi-pure filter, you're saying? Yeah, with, yeah, okay. and probably applies to other carbon filters as well. Okay. There was a, um, there was a whole web, there's a, there's a blog, a famous, like a wellness blog called Wellness Mama. You ever heard of that? No. Okay. Pretty famous. If you Google anything, there might be anything in the natural health world. There might be a good review on it on um, Wellness Mama. It originally was some girl's blog, but it kind of took off, and now it's a big. It's it's like a Joe Rogan podcast equivalent of a blog now. It's just really big and really commercialized now. So it's like they do all kinds of reviews. They did a deep dive into Berkey. You've heard of Berkey filters? Yep. So Berkey has two cartridges, or they, they actually have a few, but. I used to sell Berkey a long time ago. They have the main ones, which are these black, like black cell. They're basically solid carbon blocks. They blend it into the carbon. They have silver. So the silver is supposed to kill all the bacteria and virus, which I'm not sure if it actually kills all. Uh, people drink out of like lakes and stuff with the Berkey. I wouldn't do that, but people do it. So 
It's a gravity filter. There's the, the main black elements they're called. They're basically a solid carbon block and the water flows through it via gravity. Then they have, you can add on the bottom of those, these fluoride filters. The fluoride filters are activated aluminum. And <laughs> the claims are pretty good. I mean, it's, it's supposed to take out 80, 90% of the fluoride with the fluoride filters. Well, Wilma's mama bought it and did like tests, you know, and fluoride filters weren't performing so good because <laughs> they were activated alumina, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, this is a while, I haven't looked at this in a while, but I want to say the, the, the fluoride started out at something like 0.73. And then with both the car, the black cartridges or the black candles, basically those like little candles and the fluoride filters, it was getting it down to like 0 0.56, 0 0.54. So not very much when you're paying for a fluoride filter, you know, and she went in this big exchange with the people at the Berkey headquarters and they kept kind of dancing around and using weird language to kind of get around the questions. And the net result of that was they basically uh, changed their literature to say the fluoride filters to work. They need water that's between five and seven pH, which oh. when are you going to see that in real life, you know? So um, that's one example where basically someone just, did the testing and called out a company and they eventually um succumbed you know to the to the pressure because she had enough basically social media and web traffic to raise anger at them you know uh, but that's i would say that's a pretty typical result from other fluoride cartridges you would get whether it be bone char or activated aluminum um that kind of result and somewhere in that, this is, I should have, you know, if I would have known I was going to go to this specific thing, I would have read up on this again. But somewhere in that discourse between her and the company, Berkey admitted most of that result was coming from the carbon filter anyway. So, uh -huh. so somewhere in there, they just said, okay, this made, the fluoride filter we sold you, your, your water is obviously not five to seven. So it's probably not working. So the result you got, mostly probably from the carbon anyway. So any, all that to say, that's probably a normal result from like a carbon-based filter. And it could be better or worse, depending on what you got in the fluoride. That's number one. Number two, though, the uh, with ionizers specifically, the um, based on what I've seen, the, the, the act of um, separating the electrolyzing reducing process of separating the acid, the alkaline streams, and the polarization of the minerals in the water, I've seen tested just just with that and no pre-filter cutting the fluoride in half. I haven't seen it with my own eyes, but I've heard other people getting up to 75% with just the ionization process. So basically the water, the fluoride going out the acid tube is what that would mean. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you combine a little result with a, with a pretty good filter with what you're going to get from your machine, the combination of the two, you're going to get a pretty good result. What will it be? Impossible to say because every water chemistry is different. And I don't know, and I haven't done enough, like, I don't know if your water is harder. Will that mean you get less fluoride out or more fluoride out? I don't know. So I, I don't know all the parameters in this. Realistically, I, you, I think between the two, you can, you can expect half or more. And uh, multi-peer executives have told me they've had plenty of people call in with the Nagic system and say, hey, when I got the multi-peer aquifer form and combined that with my Nagic and I tested the Congen water coming out, I had no traceable fluoride. So that's a possible result, wow. but it's probably not going to be every time. Somewhere between half and all is, I think is what you're going to shoot for there. And that's just really as good as it gets right now. I think in terms of fluoride reduction without reverse osmosis. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Is the, and is there a way to find out how much fluoride your city puts in the water? Is yeah. This is what I use. Cause I know a lot of magic people like to use the EWG database. I would encourage you to not do that and to use the, just find out what city your client is in and just type in that, you know, Atlanta water quality report, 2023. And it, the 2023 report might not be out yet, but find the most recent one. That's just better data in my experience. Um, it's also more concise. It's also uh, presented in a way that isn't, scaring the bejeebies out of your client you know unnecessarily like a lot of the stuff i see where it's like you have um you have bromochloroform at 70 times six the epa recommended limit well you're going to get that in like a few dozen other chemicals similar to that all with the voc certification in, in the multi-peer they all fall, fall into that category it has to pass for 
like 70 something different contaminants just to get that one certification. So rather than uh, induce a lot of fear unnecessarily, I think um, I, I like to use the local water quality reports. Okay. And that will also tell you how much fluoride they put in? Yeah. If, yeah. Okay. Just, yeah, they report it. And um, you'll be able to tell because if, if it's basically if it's 0.5 or higher, they're probably adding to it. And if it's lower than that, probably they're not adding any fluoride. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So in terms of like objective and scientific data and, and all these certifications you've talked about, are how many companies out there are offering a high quality product that is backed by, you know, like NSF certifications or some other certification, performance certification? Oh, there's thousands. There's thousands. Right. And a lot of them are not even like U.S. products you would ever see. Uh, a lot of them are not even consumer grade products. They're more like, um, uh, like the ref you know, if you have a refrigerator filter, it might have NSF performance certification. Where where you differentiate once you're in that sphere of of products that pass the NSF uh, protocols, then what you're looking at is what contaminants did it pass for, and okay. and then it, by narrowing that down, you really get to kind of uh, an elite group of products. There's actually a link. Uh, or there's a page um, and I think they rearranged this since the last time I, I did a deep dive into this, but there uh, is a page where you can go on. Um, it's like a search engine for the NSF database. So you can search by um, a name of a company or a product, or you can click show me certificate or systems that are certified for lead, click the lead checkbox and hit search. But then you can do, show me lead, mercury, and volatile organics, and you'll get only systems that pass for all three of those. So um, that's where you can really narrow the field. Okay. And, and when you um, when you go down to filters that, let's say do chlorine, chloramines, mercury, lead, asbestos, and volatile organics, I don't know the exact number, but you're probably down to just a couple hundred filters at that point. Okay. Then when you go a little further, you add um, PCB, polychlorinated biphenols. This is like a industrial byproduct. MTBE, gasoline additive. So it's like it's it's all over the roads and stuff and leaks into the water supplies. Um, when you go like one level deeper with some more contaminants, the field really narrows. And at a certain point, it's it's basically multi peers in it, as far as U.S. products, multi peers like the one left standing especially when you add arsenic. Multipure is the first, and to my knowledge, the only uh, manufacturer at this point in time that's been able to have a non-reverse osmosis product pass the NSF, NSF certification for arsenic. It's an extremely tough contaminant, even in small quantities. The NSF protocol test for arsenic is 50 parts per billion. Parts per billion is, is like hard to even fathom like how small that is, but 50 is, is a lot to like, make you real sick with arsenic. Um, it's just a really tough contaminant to filter out. So um, with the blend of media, they were able to achieve that certification. They were the first. I don't know if anything else has passed. I haven't mm -hmm. seen anything out there that's passed. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's a big differentiator. But when you look at the kind of the main system I recommend for the Enagics, not the cheapest multi peer, not the most expensive one, um, it's just kind of the right one for a few reasons for the Enagix. It has that arsenic certification, chlorine, chloramines, mercury, lead, asbestos, uh, chloridane, which is a uh, pesticide that used to be used, particularly in the South, with like cotton fields and stuff. Um, toxaphene, another one. Um, PCB, arsenic. And there's a whole list of other ones I'm not even thinking of. There's a whole separate category of contaminants that are uh, what are called emerging contaminants things like pharmaceuticals, uh, pesticides that are leaching into groundwater, things like birth control, um, beta blockers, really common uh, blood pressure meds, uh, DEET, like bug spray even, you know, all these kind of new modern things. There's a whole category for that and it passes for all those. It's just kind of the sweet spot, in my opinion, for um, kind of max bang for buck as far as filtering contaminants while still leaving the minerals in there and key uh, getting a good flow rate because the more stuff your filter is taking out, 
usually that means a pretty slow flow rate out of the filter. Um, and you know, when you get in a Nagic and you just plug it to your sink, it runs pretty fast. Like even among other ionizers, it runs a, a pretty heavy flow rate. Yep. When you're, when your client, if, if they start with that and then they add a pre-filter, they're going to say, man, it slows down the flow so much. Well, they all will compared to what running it without a pre-filter, but it's tested at a gallon per minute. Um, and in reality, it can perform a little higher than that. Like gallon per quarter is pretty common. Gallon per minute, let's just say, means um, after the acid hose, you're getting about 0.7 gallons a minute. So like a minute, a little less than a minute and a half to fill up a gallon. So it's not super fast, but like for the performance you're getting to have it still be that fast, um, that's, there's really, I don't even know another product that can come close to that. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so I, I want to kind of go back. There's a couple of little things that we didn't touch on yet that I would love to just, so when someone has that, I know that I hear a lot from people, like, so when someone has really hard water, yeah. what, do you, what do you recommend that they do? So, um, this is, this is a tough one and, it, um, different ways to approach this. Uh, first of all, as far as what does that mean? Hard water. It means that TDS number is really high. We were talking about TDS earlier. Yeah. So anything over 80 could be considered hard, but like usually when people complain about hard water, usually it's like over 200, 250 or 300 at that point, you know, other than if, cause if it's not, if it's hard, but not that hard, it might have a, like a minerally taste to it, but it's really not that much of a pain. Um, when it gets real hard, you're talking about like you run your dishwasher and there's like chalk afterwards, you know, that's, yep. that's like real hard water. What do you do? Well, there's only one way to really, well, there's two ways. One, one main way to get that TDS number down. And actually it's not even getting it down. There's what water softeners are. They're a, a uh, exchange system. So the, the TDS number in really hard water primarily comes from calcium. Primarily. That's what the majority of that. If it's 300 parts per million and the water is hard like that, most cases, the overwhelming majority of that 300 is going to be calcium in some form. So what a water softener will do is it will exchange out calcium via a resin. Calcium comes out of the water and in its place goes in sodium or potassium, but usually sodium. So that's what water softeners do. So they're not lowering the TDS counts per se, but they're making the water feel a lot more like it's not as hard as it was because this the sodium just doesn't have that um doesn't leave those deposits and it um yeah. you can wash your skin better with it in the shower the challenge is it it, it does kind of have a slimy feel to it if you ever been to a house with really hard water and they have a softener you take a shower and it's like well i can i can rinse but it's like something just doesn't feel quite normal it, that's that slimy thing about the softener that's the most common way of addressing hard water and like I, I stayed at an Airbnb one time and it was, I didn't even know an Enagic, um owner and she had a water softener, salt based. And she was having to get rid of it because um, her blood pressure was going up from the sodium, you know, so side effects too. But that's the most common way to address hard water is a softener. Next, not common at all, mostly for rich people, whole house reverse osmosis. <laughs> And that's a that's an expensive kind of industrial looking um, high maintenance system. So really not for most people, uh, but that's really the only true way to get that TDS number down. It really is the only way. Then there's a whole category of salt free water conditioners, and basically what they do uh, is change the form of the calcium so that it's not going to scale as much, but the calcium's still there. So uh, when it comes to the machine, if the water is excessively hard, so we're not talking the whole house level, we're just talking about point of use for the Enagic, right? If the water is excessively hard to the point where it's causing the machine not to perform the way it should, really the only way is reverse osmosis, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So much, so much good stuff here. Um, I mean, anything else you think that we should know about multi-pure? So it sounds like multi-pure, the main benefit here is that it has 
uh, it's it's objective. It has a scientific data behind it. It's got the NSF certificate performance certifications behind it, and a wide range of contaminants that it removes. Like that's what makes it a great system. Is that is that correct? Yeah. A couple other things uh, made in the USA, including the housing. You know, stainless steel housings. Most car, most filters don't have that. Um, and you you have a multi peer, right? I do. Yeah. So you felt. I mean. It's the, the housing is like an all clad pan, one of those really expensive pans. It's like thick yep. stainless steel, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they manufacture that in the USA. That's the housing's guaranteed for life. A lot of people don't know this. When you buy one of these standard cartridges or standard housings from Ann Fawcett or anywhere, Amazon, anywhere they have these standard housings and standard cartridges inside, it, it says it, but they're not going to tell you and you probably aren't going to read it. You need to replace those every few years because they will fail eventually, you know? Yeah, you know, people. I've had calls where people you know, had it for five years and they came home from vacation and uh, you know the thing cracked because it's under it was under the sink and it's under constant pressure under the sink and yep. the pressure while they were gone and they had a big flood. So you'll never have to worry about that with multi peer. It's made in the USA. The cartridges are made in the USA. It's family owned and I've met the whole family. You can go on their website and see kind of if you click on about us, it'll have like the bios of the executives. It's basically a family company. Uh, the two founders, one of them's no longer with us. The other one's pretty old. I think he's still the CEO on paper, but basically one, one of their sons, Zachary Rice, runs the company now as the president. And it's his wife and um, is the executive vice president. And it, it's most of the high ups are in, in the same family. And, and the the that. Okay, there we go. <laughs> So important just because I've met them. Uh, I've met them not like once, but interacted with them many times over the course of, you know, um, one that I, I think I I, I started with Multipure in 2009. So I've, I've met them in person multiple times and just been a lot of webinars and calls with them. They're just high integrity people. And it's frustrated me in the past with them because they're just so leaning on the side of only marketing and uh, presenting things that they can unquestionably prove that sometimes it was frustrating. Cause like there's, I thought there was potential benefits or ways to go with the products that had a more sexy appeal or, uh, and they're just like, you know, if we can prove that, if we can have a product that does with fluoride, for example, um, that's their number one request is to have like basically a multi peer filter that will pass the NSF test for fluoride without reverse osmosis and they're working on it and it's their number one objective of their research team but they're yeah. not going to release anything on that front until it's going to pass that protocol you know yeah and if anyone does it it's going to be them because they have the in-house um, research team for it um so they're i would say rather conservative uh on in their kind of company culture the presentation of their products the marketing claims of their products so, um, but they've been around 50 years. So they've stood the test of time. Oh, wow. So they manufacture their own products. They're um, one of the biggest carbon block manufacturers in the world. Uh, they're well-respected around the whole industry. They're basically um, pillars of the water filtration industry. Um, on the technology side, when you look at them, you might think, well, there's other carbon blocks out there. What's the difference between those and the multi-peer ones? Multipeer is the only one in the entire country manufacturing, and they're one of the only ones in the whole world, manufacturing carbon blocks the way they do. There's two ways to make it. One of them is called extrusion. Extrusion means they're taking the binding agents, the, the media they put in the block to basically hold the block together. Um, without the binding agents, it would be like the carbon block would come out, and if you threw it on the ground, it would just go back to dust. So the binding agents hold it together. And the binding agent materials are all NSF certified, so they're safe. Well, there's two ways to do this. One's called extrusion. Uh, I went down a long rabbit hole with this with some engineers. I'll, I'll try to keep it like concise here. Basically, it's like if you could imagine a machine uh, with carbon bucket and the binding materials bucket, and they're going in. So we, we lost you just for a second. If you can start that process again, we just, and I think it's on my end, actually. Okay, no problem. It says my internet is unstable. So if you, I can just start sharing with the binding agents again, that'd be great. Yeah. 
So multi-pure uses a process called compression. What most carbon blocks are 99% on the market, they use what's called extrusion. You could just imagine a machine, it's got a bucket of carbon over here and a bucket of the binding materials over here. They're both flooding in to this pressure heat thing and out comes this like gradually for, like coming out donut. It looks like a donut or a toilet paper roll, right? And then comes out in a big log and then they cut the log into the sizes. Multipure uses a different approach where they mix the binding and carbon together and they put it in a mold. And then the mold with the with the middle part of it um, to have the like the basically the center of it that's hollow, the mold gets pushed under heat and pressure into its form one at a time. So they're not spitting out a big log and slicing them. They're they're making like one, they're making a big one and slicing it like into a couple pieces, but something like that big and then cutting it. Um one at a time. So it's a lot more labor intensive, but the, why is that important? They can use a lot uh, more types of binding materials. And part of their kind of secret recipe for performance is they really have tweaked the combination of binding materials. And I don't even know what they are so that they can use a lot less binding material. So bottom line is like in a multi-pure, they can use other medias besides the carbon that won't even work in extrusion. They can have a lot more of the filtration media and a lot less of the binding material so that when you're putting the water through that, there's just a lot more stuff actually doing something in it versus just kind of taking up space. And if you held an extruded one and a compressed one, you really wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But the way they're made is pretty critical for their performance difference. Wow. Wow. We don't find any factor in the country doing that. And I, I've only found another one in the world doing compression for carbon blocks and they're in India. So um, they're basically it. And I've talked to guys cause they do, they have a whole other division that does private manufacturing for industrial projects. Uh, I've talked to people just that I've found through weird ways that for their industrial applications had their carbon blocks manufactured by multi-peer because they needed a certain recipe and none of the other US based carbon block manufacturers could even do it except multi-pure because with the compression that recipe could work because there's just so much less binding material. Wow. Fascinating. Wow. Um, yeah. You are a wealth of knowledge. I love it. <laughs> uh, you. You yeah. <laughs> so yeah, obviously this is a passion for you. Um, just another, I, I want to kind of wrap things up here too, just because of sure. the time, but um, do they, do they deliver to Canada? That would be another question I have. Yeah. So let's, let's cover that real quick. With the multi-peer deal, if you become a builder with them, it's something in the same neighborhood like the Enagic, a um, little different, but um, number one, the lion's share of the commission goes to the person selling it. So it's not as spread, there's levels and stuff under you, but the majority of the of the margin goes to whoever sells the unit. Um, it's open to US, Canada, Puerto Rico. Um, unfortunately, it's not international and just because they don't have offices in all these countries, and the customs was a nightmare. So what they have instead for Europe and South America and Central America and Asia, they have territory distributors that have exclusive rights for those areas. So if you have a client in like China or Thailand or something or Japan, no, you can't sell them a multi-pure, unfortunately. Okay. But yeah, if you're in the US or Canada, or Puerto Rico, you can buy it and you can sell them as a builder. To become a builder, you have to um, buy your own unit, number one, just like an adjective. And then there's a one-time $50 registration fee. And that for that, you get like a kit in the mail. It's got a cut in half cartridge. So you can see what it looks like and some literature to basically get you started. So that's how that works. Okay, perfect. Amazing. Oh my gosh. Um, so, and just to let people know here too, that if anyone's interested in purchasing a multi-peer filter, getting more information, um, that myself, I'm a distributor, Jessica Villafato is a distributor, and Elena Nathy, who's also on this call, she's also a distributor. Um, and you can reach out to any of us and get more information. So, and we all have a 5% discount code that you can access as well. So that's also important. And yeah, any last thing that you want to share, Joseph, just as a, just that if we, if we missed something or that you want to touch on? Um, well, what just crossed my mind is you can also get in touch with me, um, probably not initially, but you can get in touch with one of you guys. And every day I'm um, taking chats and calls 
from um, some, and I don't even know where they all are in my, in my downline anymore, but I just, whatever comes to me, I'm, I'm glad to help. Um, people also bring <laughs> these days, I get a lot of uh, inquiries about uh, problems, maybe not necessarily related directly to the multi-peer, but just cause uh, let's say unique scenarios with water sources as pertaining to an magic, or even sometimes not within an object, just really weird water challenges people run into. So you can get in touch with me as well. Uh, if, if you join part of this group and, um, I'm not always available on demand because I'm pretty busy during the day, but I'll get back to you within a day or two. Yeah, you're you're amazing at that. We can all attest to that. Myself, Jessica, Jess Belafato, and um, yeah, Elena, they're all saying this. Um, and so, and Vivi is asking, this hooks up to all the Enagic machines, the JR4, the SD501, and the K8, right? Like it's it's just a pre-filter. Doesn't, that doesn't really Correct. make a difference. Yeah. If you can, and, and part, one question that comes up a lot, how do and I- And the JR2, too, she's asking about too, the old Enagic model that some people still have. Um, I don't know for specifically for that one, because I think that was a little bit before I uh, got familiar with the Enagic stuff. But um, but if it has that same size inlet holes with the green stripe, it, it'll work. Okay, okay. Yeah. It's got a different hose, you know, talk to me and, and um, we'll, we'll figure it out. Figure it out, okay. Yeah. Okay. Basically, if you if you can hook up your Enagic to whatever water source you're plugging into, whether it's below the sink or the countertop, um, you can find a way to plug the multi-pure into it and it, we can help you figure that out. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Well, let's give uh, Joseph some love here and thank him for his time. Thank you so much. I, I also see that Howard and Carol are also distributors. So there's several people here who have done multi-pure. I'm super grateful to have that and giving my family like the best water we can find. So um, thank you, thank you so much. This has been super helpful and Great. will be shared with lots and lots of people, I am certain. <laughs> Great, yeah. And uh, guys, if you have any questions, you know, get in touch and um, you know, you can get to me ultimately. And I, I'll be, if you get stuck on something, I'm glad to help figure out anything you need. Amazing, all right. Thank you so much. Bye everyone, bye Joseph. Thank mm -hmm. you.